army over here has the best equipment and weapons that money can buy. But money, lots of money, is needed to keep these weapons pouring from the factory to the front. It is in the interests of the armed forces and of Canada that equipment shall continue to be available in quantity and in quality as long as this war lasts in order to save young Canadian lives. But such equipment is expensive and must be paid for, and all Canadians must help. And so I ask you to put victory first and buy a bomb. By doing so, you are not only helping your country and yourself, but your contribution will be instrumental in assisting to save the life of a young Canadian, somebody's son or daughter, husband, sweetheart, or friend. Is not this worth an additional sacrifice on your part? I am sure you will agree that it is. Canadian invasion troops are visited by General Montgomery. With the second front rushing inevitably toward reality, Monty is anxious to get a good look at the men who will help him smash the fortress of Europe. Wearing a sheepskin Air Force jacket and his familiar beret, he mounts a jeep and invites the men to break ranks and gather round. What Monty is telling the Canadians is a military secret, but you may be sure that he is promising the Germans a lot of headaches in the months to come. Lieutenant General Stuart and other Canadian officers listen intently to his words of inspiration and plans for the liberation of Europe. Our Canadian hockey game comes in for a typical Montgomery once-over. Monty shakes hands with members of the teams, one a famous Highland regiment, the other from a reinforcement unit. He faces off the puck and the game is on. This was the second game in the finals for the Canadian Army Hockey Championship in England and it was won by the reinforcement unit B group by nine to two. As they won the first game by eight to four, they took the championship, but they defeated a game and scrappy team and the play was not as lopsided as the score would indicate. After the game, Monty shook hands with Lance Corporal F.R. Clark, coach of the winners, and presented prizes to the members of the team. For the first time in the history of the Canadian Army, men from the Dominion marched to St. George's Chapel at Windsor to attend divine service. Through the Henry VIII gateway to Windsor Castle, Royal Canadian Army Service Corps units, a thousand strong, parade to the historic church. the service, the troops line up in the courtyard of the castle where Brigadier McQueen presents his trophy to a Canadian tank transporter company for the best maintenance of vehicles throughout the year.
One of the big features of the warfare in Italy, as on every other front, is a psychological warfare carried on by both sides. These pamphlets, with news of the Russian breakthrough in the Pripyat marshes, will make rather startling reading for the German soldier who has been lulled into a false belief that all is well on the Eastern Front. This may not be the safest way to deliver the morning paper, but it's very effective. In the cemetery, overlooking the town of Azura, scene of the grimmest fighting the Canadians encountered in Sicily, a memorial cross has been erected. It commemorates the gallantry of the men who gave their lives in the Sicilian campaign. Far from the shores of their beloved country, it is a place that will remain forever Canada. Peacetime travel posters invite you to sunny Italy where beauty and romance abound. Beautiful roads winding through country unsurpassed for scenery. Well, this is Italy, and here is some of the scenery, and this is the romance. The sun has probably been taken over by the Nazis. At a divisional cooking school somewhere in Italy near the front line, cooks of Canadian regiments on the Italian front are taking a refresher course. hardtack are a thing of the past as these boys of the kitchen front learn all the latest wrinkles in slapping out a batch of bun. This process is called camouflaging the bully beef and to the boys in the field these meat pies are tops. Part of the course was instruction in making improvised ovens from old bricks, gasoline tins, etc. They might not look so hot but they do the job. Awards were recently made in Italy to Canadians who had distinguished themselves in battle. Among those honored were Company Sergeant Major Drapo of Montreal, the Distinguished Conduct Medal, Captain Sharp of Woodstock, New Brunswick, the Military Cross, Private Magistad of Vermilion, Alberta, the Military Medal, Corporal McLeod of West Bay, Inverness, Nova Scotia, the Military Medal, Corporal Way, Sydney Mines, New Brunswick, the Military Medal. Lieutenant Kenyon of Hamilton, Ontario, the Military Cross. Major Fraser of Toronto, the Distinguished Service Order. Sergeant McDougall of Toronto, the Military Medal. Corporal Bars of Winnipeg, Manitoba, the Military Medal. Corporal Daler of Ottawa, the Military Medal. Brigadier Matthews of Toronto, the DSO. Major Brown of Ottawa, the DSO. Captain Cadigan of Glace Bay, the MC. Bombardier Row of Toronto, the MM. Captain Watson of Pincher Creek, Alberta, the MC. Lance Bombardier Rollins of Vancouver, BC, the MM. And Bombardier Reynolds of Vancouver, the Military Medal. Canada's second winner of the Victoria Cross in this war is Major Paul Triquet of Montreal, a company commander in the Royal 22nd Regiment. Supported by tanks, he and his company were subjected to deadly fire of enemy machine guns and mortars as they attacked Casa Berardi. With all his officers and half his men casualties, he discovered that they were being surrounded. With a call that the only safe place is the objective, they pressed on. Major Triquet, two sergeants and 15 men reached Casa Berardi and fought off repeated counterattacks until relieved by their battalion. When asked about the award, Major Triquet replied, I am glad for my unit and Canadians 
that we have the first Victoria Cross to be awarded in Italy.